Now, Artifact is the highest level rarity of items in the game. There's a good chance you won't ever see an artifact while playing an average game, or your whole campaign can be about just obtaining a single artifact. With that in mind, there aren't very many official ones in game, but there are enough to talk about the 10 best ones nonetheless. And at number 10, we have the Mighty Servant of Leko, from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This artifact item is kind of like one of those robots from Pacific Rim, where it requires two pilots in order to control a single mech. Although, this artifact doesn't require two pilots, but it can have two of them, as it can be attuned to by up to two creatures at the same time. And in order to use it, you have to climb inside of it and control it, and the construct can move 60 feet a turn and attack with its destructive fist at range or melee, which hits for around 36 damage on average, with a plus 17 to its hit modifier. So its stats are almost like that of an ancient dragon. It also has around 310 health and a whole bunch of immunities and resistances to damage. And since it can be controlled by two people, the construct basically gets to move two times and attack two times during a round, as each of its drivers are able to independently control the creature during their turn, and use their action in order to make the construct perform one of its actions, and they're able to have it move its full 60 feet of movement. Now, the damage this thing is able to accomplish is not better than what a player can do in tier 4 levels of play, which is why it's kind of low on this list. Sure, it does give you a cool robot to control that does hit pretty hard for a machine, and even has a nice distinction of dealing triple damage to objects, but you can deal more damage than this thing yourself if you're level 17 and above on pretty much any class. But if you're in tier 3 levels of play and below, or below level 16, and somehow get your hands on this artifact, that's when it becomes a lot better and more useful. It also regains 10 hit points every turn, cannot be destroyed by normal means, and has a really bad negative effect, where if it goes below 50% health, it tries to mind control both of its occupants, and each attuned creature must succeed a DC 20 wisdom saving throw or be charmed for 24 hours. That's a pretty hard wisdom save for even tier 4 levels of players to make. And while charmed by the robot, the creatures will force you to go on a destructive spree destroying objects and structures nearby, preferably using the robot itself if possible, but that's not a requirement. The machine also has a self-destruct sequence which isn't actually known by the people who attune to it, and has to be given to the players by the DM in some other way. And if you spend three actions trying to initiate the self-destruct sequence and you know how to do it, you can have it blow up for around 261 damage in a 100 foot radius but it also kills the occupants inside, leaving no remains. And that doesn't actually kill the construct, as it will come back about five days later and slowly rebuild itself, kind of like the Iron Giant. However, if you're trying to initiate its self-destruct sequence, it will use its ability to mind control you by forcing the DC-20 wisdom save. So, all in all, it's a neat mech that you can control and have it take around 150 damage before it initiates its mind control procedure. And with how much resistances and damage immunities it has, plus healing 10 points every turn, it can take quite a beating before it reaches that point. And at number 9, we have the Sword of Kas. This is a plus 3 weapon which has a built-in defender property, which is a legendary item in of itself, that also, once per day, allows you to cast Finger of Death, with the DC of 18. Or I guess technically it does have two other spells that can allow you to cast. You can choose to cast Call Lightning or Divine Word, but Finger of Death is one of the better options of the three spells the sword can cast, as it can only use one of them per day. Outside of being able to cast a 7th level spell for free, it also has an increased crit range, deals bonus damage to undead, and gives you a plus 1d10 bonus to your initiation. So it has the potential to give you a plus 10 to an initiation roll, which will almost guarantee that you go first in a round which is great in everything, but the sword does also have a downside, where if you draw the sword, you need to make something bleed within one minute, otherwise the sword will take control of your character if you fail a DC 15 charisma saving throw, where it then forces you to bathe in blood, but if you succeed, you only take 3d6 psychic damage instead. Now, the sword itself is decent enough, but it is beaten and damaged by some legendary items, so if you're trying to increase the damage of your character by the most, the Sword of Cast is not going to be what you're looking for, as the Moonblade technically can give you way more damage than this artifact item, or even the Blood Fury tattoo. But surprisingly, a lot of the artifact weapons don't increase your damage by very much anyway. A lot of them focus on just giving you a whole bunch of unconventional effects, or some game-breaking ones. And this one doesn't really have any game-breaking effects, but it does have a lot of nice bonuses stacked up 
The free use of a spell once per day, the higher crit range, the increased initiation, the ability to grant you 3 AC with its defender effect, and of course, the effect that you gain from the minor and major beneficial properties. And the downside is actually pretty tame when compared to some of the other downsides of artifact items. I had to exclude some of the really good ones off this list because their downsides were just so bad. Like the Crook of Rao, an artifact that has a downside where you have a chance to open a demon portal that summons a constant swarm of demons every 6 seconds for 18 years. And I think being forced to occasionally kill something is not as bad as opening a demon portal for 18 years. And at number 8 we have the Book of Exalted Deeds. This is one of the few artifact items which only has beneficial properties and no negative ones, which allows you to have two minor and two major beneficial properties. And the majors are kind of strong. For those of you who don't know, most artifact items have this property on them where you can roll for minor and major beneficial or detrimental properties. Some minor negative properties can be simply things like you smell bad or have an increased weight to a, a little bit more extreme things like making all animals hostile towards you or making you blinded when you're not near your artifact. And the major negative properties are even worse. Some of them can change your alignment or make an entire species of creatures hostile towards you. Although the beneficial ones are all pretty great, especially the major ones. Those can give you benefits like having the regeneration skill, where you heal for 1d6 hit points at the start of each of your turns as long as you have one hit point. Or it can allow you to cast a random spell attached to the item that you can use once per day. They can permanently increase your walking speed by 10 feet, or it can increase the damage the item deals. So only having four beneficial properties is excellent. I don't think any other artifact shares this distinction. All of them have a little bit of downsides when they give you beneficial properties. Now, Book of Exalted Deeds isn't on this list for just having good properties, although that is a huge bonus in its favor. It also gives you a plus 2 to your wisdom score and allows you to take it over 20, as this bonus can pull you all the way up to 24 potentially. It gives you a halo effect, which will give you advantage on persuasion and intimidation checks, plus disadvantage to fiends and undeads who try to attack you within 10 feet. And if you're a paladin or cleric, any paladin or cleric spell you cast will count as if it was cast one spell level higher. Although it does have a downside, the book requires you to perform a good act once every 10 days. The book is also only usable by good aligned creatures, and you can lose a tomb into it if you willingly commit an evil task. So if your character is forced into a morally gray situation where they have to do something evil, the book can choose to unattune to you because it doesn't like what you did or if you just don't go out and be proactive in doing good deeds once every 10 days. But honestly, as far as negative effects go of an artifact, that's pretty minor. So having a nice stat increase above 20, only having beneficial properties, and the ability to have advantage on charisma based checks with good creatures, it's a pretty decent artifact item to give to a good aligned character. Even if it's a little bit weak when it comes to actual damage increasing benefits. And at number 7, we have the Demonomicon of Igwil from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This book has the ability to allow you to cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter an unlimited amount of times, which is a pretty decent first level spell to gain the ability to cast infinitely. It also has a lot of abilities related to fiends, where it allows you to deal max spell damage against fiends. If you use the spell's Magic Circle or Planner Binding against a fiend, it allows you to do so at 9th level, and giving that fiend disadvantage on saving throws against both of those spells. It allows you to summon fiends, it allows you to capture a fiend once a day, and it allows you to plane shift into layers of the abyss. Although it does have a pretty nasty downside, where the book will always have 1 to 4 demons already inside of it when you first get it, and each day that you spend a long rest on the same plane of existence as the book, the highest challenge rating demon in the book will attempt to possess you on a failed DC 20 charisma saving throw. And you can't release the demons yourself in order to manually kill them, so you can't really have the book without this downside. Unless your DM is nice and gives you the book without any demons inside of it. You can also trap fiends inside the first 10 pages of the book with its containment ability, as long as you use the book on a fiend that's currently trapped inside a magic circle spell. The book has 8 charges and allows you to cast a number of spells by spending the required amount of charges. It allows you to spend 1 charge to cast Magic Circle, and if you're using it to name fiends, it allows you to cast it at 9th level. And what Magic Circle does is it basically creates a barrier in a 10 foot radius, which makes it so creatures of your designated type cannot get inside the barrier, and it has to pass a charisma save in order to teleport or plane shift inside. 
And while you're inside the barrier, creatures of the chosen type have disadvantage on attack rolls against you. You can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by creatures of those types. You can also choose to inverse the casting of the spell, which will prevent creatures inside the field from leaving in the same way. Although Magic Circle has a one minute cast time, so it's pretty difficult to actually contain a demon inside, since you basically have to keep them controlled for a full minute. Unless you can cast it instantly with this item. As it does say, you can use the spells with a single action. But I'm not 100% sure on that. And when you cast at higher level spells, it increases the duration of the spell for a maximum of 7 hours of cast at 9th level. So what you can do in order to circumvent the downsides of the Demonomicon is just cast Magic Circle before you take a long rest, as you're immune to being possessed by creatures of your designated type. And the book allows you to cast it at 9th level if you choose Fiends. Plus, you'll get all the charges back the next day anyway. So as long as you just have one charge of the book before long rest, you can kind of circumvent the downside. Now, it also allows you to cast Planner Binding at 9th level, which is a spell that allows you to basically mind control a monster, and has a duration that's based on the increased spell level. And if you cast it at 9th level, it allows you to control a fiend for up to a full year, who has disadvantage on that saving throw, which is a DC 20. A very hard saving throw to actually pass normally. And being able to dominate a fiend monster for a full year is pretty useful. So if you're in a campaign that has a lot of fiends, this book is going to be incredibly overpowered, which is kind of reasonable for an artifact item, considering the power levels we're dealing with here. Now, because of its really nasty downside if you don't find ways to circumvent its downside, it is kind of lower on the list, but still makes the top 10 nonetheless. And at number 6, we have the Axe of the Dwarvish Lords. This is a plus 3 battle axe, which basically functions as 4 other magic items all at once, where it has the properties of the Belt of Dwarven Kind, the Dwarven Thrower, the Sword of Sharpness, and the Stone of Controlling Earth Elementals. Now, with the benefits of all these items, basically it gives you a plus 2 to your constitution score, advantage on charisma checks with dwarves, Advantage on saving throws against poisons as well as resistance to poison damage. Dark Vision, the ability to cast the Conjure Elemental spell, summoning an Earth Elemental once a day. The ability to know the Dwarvish language. The Axe gains the Throne property, which allows it to deal an extra 1d8 damage if thrown. And the weapon will fly back to your hand afterwards. It allows you to deal maximum damage to objects. You can have the item glow if you speak its command word, and if you roll a 20 with its attack roll, the item will deal an additional 4d6 slashing damage. And those are just the properties it gains from those four magic items, plus a downside of a 50% chance to grow a full beard every day. In addition to those effects, it has some artifact properties like pretty much all the other artifacts. It allows you to teleport if you touch the axe to a dwarven stonework, and gives you some nice benefits if you attune to the item while you are a dwarf where it basically boosts your racial abilities, granting you immunity to poison damage, increasing your dark vision by plus 60 feet, and giving you proficiency in artisan tools related to blacksmithing, brewing, and stonemasonry. And just like all artifacts, it has downsides, where there's a curse associated to the axe, where if you're attuned to this item and you're not a dwarf, each passing day your physical appearance and stature will become more dwarf-like, where after seven days, you'll fully look exactly like a dwarf although you don't gain any of the dwarves' racials, nor do you lose any racials you have. But you can undo it with a greater restoration or remove curse spell. So, as long as you have access to those two spells, you can keep just undoing the curse if you don't want to look like a dwarf. And seeing as a downside is purely cosmetic, this is one of the lightest downsides out of all the artifacts so far. So, for having the properties of four magic items, including being a plus three weapon, and giving you a super boost to your racials if you're a dwarf, it's a pretty decent weapon, which unfortunately is beaten out by some legendary items when it comes to increasing your damage on martial classes. It has lots of utility though. You can possibly get a nice damage boost from one of its beneficial properties, but if all you care about is increasing your damage as a martial class, it does lose out to the Moonblade or Blood Fury tattoo. Two lesser legendary items. And at number five, we have the Teeth of Dalvinar from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This artifact item has the ability to grant a character a few effects with only one attunement, and really good effects too. As long as you're attuned to the whole pouch of teeth, you're able to implant a number of teeth equal to your constitution score plus one, for a minimum of two teeth. So if you have a constitution score of 20, you'll be able to have six teeth implanted, 
And what you can do is reach into the pouch and pull out a tooth, where you can then choose to implant the tooth into your mouth or plant the tooth into the ground. And depending on which effect you choose to activate, you can roll from a table to either gain a permanent effect if you try to plant the tooth into your mouth, or summon a creature if you plant the tooth into the ground, which will be friendly to you for 10 minutes. And don't worry too much about planting the tooth into your mouth. It will just cause one of your teeth to fall out and then graft itself into your mouth to be an exact copy of that tooth. And the effects of the tooth are one of 20 from a rolled table, where you can either have eight charges of Revivify, which will cast itself automatically on yourself when you die, or gain three charges to heal and cure diseases and poisons every day, gain the ability to essentially read minds permanently, gain a 4d6 unarmed attack bite, a 9th level counter spell once a day, the 8th level spell dominate monster once a day, a flight speed and the ability to cast detect magic at will, immunity to fire damage, immunity to lightning damage, the ability to use an ancient red dragon's flame breath attack, the ability to call on a divine intervention, and probably one of the best abilities, the ability to cause an extra 3d10 damage to a target who hasn't taken damage in the combat yet. Which, if comboed with a spell that hits multiple times, like a magic missile spell cast at 9th level, then it can deal some ridiculous damage, as it stacks with all of those instances of damage. Well, kind of. There are some complicated rules, but it should work with magic missiles. Also, giving a monk a 4d6 unarmed bite is really good as well. So are a lot of the other abilities. Alternatively, if you don't want to attune to a tooth and gain one of the potentially really good abilities, you can instead plant it into the ground in order to summon a monster that will be friendly to you for 10 minutes, with some really good standouts being an ancient blue dragon, a pit fiend, or a Tarrasque. Although the Tarrasque only gets summoned for 1d4 rounds, ignores you and your commands, and then vanishes. So the summoning of one of the ancient dragons is probably one of the better ones, but you also have a chance to summon not so useful creatures, like a single commoner or nine normal cats. So if used to summon creatures, you can potentially get some really good allies to help you for 10 minutes. And if you choose to try to gain one of the effects, you can have the potential to gain a really good one. These teeth seem like a great item to give to a uh, lower adventuring level party, with some of the abilities being really good at high levels too. Like the Mill Road Murderer's Tooth that gives you an extra 3d10 damage in targets that haven't taken damage in the combat yet. Now, there are some downsides to the teeth. Some of the effects have more negative effects than positive ones. Like one of them gives you scales and a plus 2 to AC, but makes you perform a constitution saving throw every time you sleep or else you take one level of exhaustion. And the tooth which grants you a 9th level counter spell every day requires you to use that counter spell every day, otherwise you lose 2d10 health permanently and then die if you reach zero health in this way. So potentially having up to six random effects is good, but even if you just use them to plant teeth into the ground to summon monsters, a majority of the options are temporary great allies, which makes it an excellent artifact item if a little bit random. And at number four, we have the Wand of Orcus. This one can basically allow you to summon a horde of zombies once a day. It also has good stats and a manageable downside. The wand can act as a plus 3 base, which deals an additional 2d12 necrotic damage if you use it as a melee weapon, which is equivalent to the damage of two great axe attacks, the highest damage dice of a normal weapon. So it's a pretty competitive martial weapon, despite the fact that it's a wand, and mainly used for wand-like things. It also grants you a plus 3 bonus to your AC, the highest amount of AC you can be granted from an item, and it allows you to cast some nice spells, seeing as it's a wand and everything. It has 7 charges and allows you to cast a number of spells with a DZ18 saving throw by spending some of those charges, with standout ones being Circle of Death, which is a really nice AoE, or Finger of Death, which is a really high damage dealing single target nuke. And of course if you spend 4 charges you can cast the 9th level spell Power Word Kill, which allows you to instantly kill any target as long as it has less than 100 hit points, without a saving throw. And then the main ability of the item, Call Undead where you can call forth a number of skeletons or zombies just as long as their hit points evenly divide to be under 500. So you can call forth 22 zombies or 38 skeletons, or a combination of those two. And since the zombies and skeletons are magically created, you don't need corpses nearby to use it. And the zombies last for an entire day and obey all of your commands, with the ability resetting every day. So basically, once a day, you get a horde of zombies that you can use for whatever you want. In tier 4 levels of play, 
a horde of CR 1 4th creatures isn't going to be doing very much damage, as if you bring out 38 skeletons and they all attack with their shortbow attack, that's only 190 damage on average, assuming all of those attacks hit. And with only a plus 4 to their attack rolls, they're going to be missing a lot against high CR creatures. However, if we use mob combat rules and assume a creature we're fighting has an AC of 20, then 38 skeletons all attacking with their short bow or melee weapons deal 45 damage guaranteed, although an ancient red dragon has an AC of 22, which brings down the damage to 25 damage guaranteed for all 38 attacks from the skeletons, which is not a lot for having to control a horde. The zombies are even worse when it comes to damage, as they only have a plus 3 to their chance to hit and only deal 4 damage on average, although zombies are much harder to kill and have a higher health pool. So there are advantages to having both of them or a mixture of the two, and of course the advantages of just having a whole bunch of creatures on the battlefield you can control, which can allow you to perform a whole bunch of special maneuvers, like having them absorb damage by getting in the way, forcing opportunity attacks, providing bodies for flanking, having them try to grapple, etc, etc. And this is just one action you can do with the item, in addition to the wand having some really nice spells to cast, or just being a really good melee weapon. And of course, the downsides of the wand. When you try to attune to the item, there is a chance it can kill you. As part of the attunement process, you have to make a DC 17 constitution saving throw, and on a success, you take 10d6 necrotic damage, which is only around 35 damage on average. Pretty much all tier 4 level players can survive the attunement damage, but if you fail the saving throw, you instead die and get risen as a zombie, which makes it very hard to bring you back to life. However, if you manage to survive the attunement process, then there isn't really too many other downsides besides the detrimental properties of the artifact item, as it does have a grand total of 3 of them, in addition to a major detrimental property, which can be kind of bad for most characters if you roll really badly on that chart. Now, the wand also has some extra benefits if you're the lore character, Orcus, controlling the wand himself, or if Orcus himself blesses the person who has the wand. But chances are that's not going to come up, so I'm just going to ignore those for this video, and only talk about what you gain if you don't involve Orcus at all. And what you get is a lot of really good benefits, with only the small downside that it might kill you when you try to attune to it, which is kind of worth it for what you get out of it. And at number 3, we have the Sword of Zariel from Descent into Avernus. When you attune to this item, it basically turns you into an angel and gives you a whole bunch of really good benefits, like setting your charisma score to 20, gaining advantage on insight checks to detect lies, the thing people use insight checks for the most, permanent true sight, resistance to necrotic and radiant damage, extra benefits versus fiends, and 90 feet of flying speed, which is huge for players to have. That's literally triple the baseline movement speed, which allows for all kinds of battleground shenanigans, where you can fly in and hit and then just fly around a corner so you can't be targeted by anything. In addition, the sword itself does extra damage when used as a one-handed weapon, where it deals an additional 2d8 radiant damage, which is higher damage than a great sword, and if you're wielding it two-handed, it deals an additional 3d10 radiant damage instead, which is equivalent to hitting three times with a longsword. So if you wield the sword with two hands, it hits four times harder than a normal longsword. The sword also only has two minor beneficial properties, so no real downsides to the detrimental properties on this weapon, other than the fact that it does change your personality too. When you attune to the sword, the sword only lets you attune to it if it deems you a worthy person, and then will override your personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. So from an RP standpoint, this can completely change your character into basically a much more good version of himself. But since the sword only really allows good aligned people to attune to it anyway, it's not really that much of a detriment. Basically, its only downside can be completely ignored if all you care about is the numbers. If all you want is a really good sword and don't care about your character becoming an angel of goodness, the Sword of Zariel is pretty great. Definitely one of the better artifact items, really easy to use, with a whole bunch of good benefits, and can almost deal more damage than a Moonblade. Although I can't really stress enough just how good having 90 feet of fly speed is, and permanent true sight. Definitely a 9 out of 10 artifact item. The top two spots only beat it out by virtue of just being a tiny bit more broken. And at number two, we have the Worm Skull Throne from Storm King's Thunder. Now, this throne can only be used if you control another item called the Ruling Scepter. But for this item, we're going to assume you have both the throne and one of the scepters, because the only thing the scepter does is allow you to use the throne, basically. 
Now, while you have control of the throne correctly, because if you don't have the scepter, the throne will just lock you inside of it, you gain a number of pretty powerful benefits, like most artifact items. The throne allows you to fly 30 feet a turn, and allows you to go through walls and earth. It has 9 charges and allows you to spend those charges in order to do one of three things. You can spend one charge to cast the lightning bolt spell at 9th level, which deals 14d6 lightning damage to everything in a 20 foot line, which is not half bad for a feature that you can do 9 times a day. It also allows you to spend 2 charges to cast the globe of invulnerability from the throne, which affects both the creature and the throne itself, which basically makes you immune to 5th level and lower spells for 1 minute while still being able to use your own spells from inside the throne to attack other things. And finally, the main function of the throne, you can spend three charges in order to create a spectral ancient blue dragon that surrounds the throne, which at the end of your turn will attack with the ancient blue dragon's multi-attack basically, where it will use one bite and two claw attacks against targets of your choice, which have the exact same stats and damage of an ancient blue dragon's bite and claw attacks. And this spectral image lasts for one minute, so basically, for an entire minute, you gain an extra round of Ancient Blue Dragon attacks at the end of your turn, which is just an insane damage boost that can be basically free on all of your subsequent turns. There isn't really a buff that allows you to deal an extra 63 damage on average every turn while also being able to do your other full actions, and the downside to the throne aren't really that bad, just as long as you have the scepter, as it only really has flavorful things where you hear faint whispers, but there's no mechanical negative side effects to those whispers. So, you just get an awesome throne that can move through walls, fires 9th level lightning bolts as his basic attack, can become immune to most spells for a minute, and deal the damage of an ancient blue dragon at the end of each of your turns. When it comes to pure combat potential, the Worm Skull throne is one of the best with the spectral dragon image ability, probably second only to the number 4 tooth in the teeth of Delvinar which allows you to deal an additional 3d10 damage with your first attack. The number one item on this list doesn't beat the throne when it comes to damage potential, but it does beat it in different ways. And at number one, we have the Eye in Hand of Vecna. Now technically, this is two separate items, but they have a set bonus that activates when you use both of them together, where if you're attuned to both the Hand and Eye, you gain the benefits where you're immune to diseases and poisons, your x-ray vision doesn't have negative side effects, you can't be surprised, you gain 1d10 hit points every turn, you gain a spam touch spell that allows you to instantly kill creatures if they fail a DC 18 constitution saving throw, and the biggest bonus is once every 30 days you can use an action to cast the wish spell. Now normally when you get an item to cast the wish spell, you can circumvent the downsides of wish by just using it on a character who can't use wish anyway, but with the eye in hand not really allowing you to pass them around, you do actually have to stick to the rules of the wish spell with this item. But even then, getting a free wish every 30 days is great if you're on a fighter that normally can't use it anyway, or if you're a spellcaster who can, this would give you two wish spells in one day which could help you win an important encounter. And even the legendary items that do allow you to cast the wish spell, like the luck blade or the ring of three wishes, only allow you to use them a limited number of times and then you can never use them again. Whereas the eye in hand of Vecna allows you to do them once every month. Still a pretty sizable cooldown on the ability but you could potentially use more wish spells than those legendary items. And remember, with the wish spell, you could do basically anything your DM allows you to get away with. You could summon an endless army of giants to destroy the world, for example. Or you could give yourself and nine of the party members permanent resistance to fire damage. If you do something creative with it though, you have a chance of a monkey paw scenario popping up, where the DM can twist the wish or just doesn't allow it to happen. Plus, there's a 33% chance you won't be able to use Wish again. As it turns out, casting spells through items counts as you casting the spell, so you still suffer the negative side effects of those spells. So if you want to avoid that, you can still make great use out of it if you just use it to instantly cast an 8th level or lower spell with no cost. Some standout examples being obviously the 7th level spell Simulacrum, to duplicate a friendly spellcaster or yourself for a great combat partner, or a great ally that lasts until it's destroyed normally requiring a 12 hour cast time and 1500 gold, instant and free if you use Wish. You could use the 7th level spell Resurrection to bring a dead party member back to life to full health, but with negative 4 to all of its rolls, or bring someone back who died up to 100 years ago, normally a 1 hour cast time and 1000 gold, free to cast with Wish. Even some lower level spells like Hollow or Awaken, 
Hollow has a 24 hour cast time and a 1000 gold cost, but allows you to enchant a 60 foot area to do all kinds of beneficial effects. Like one of them is to make all enemies vulnerable to a type of magic damage. Awakened can be used on a nearby animal or plant to create a 30 day pet that can scout or help out in combat. And so on and so on, there's lots of useful applications of Wish, even if you only use it in its safe way. Now, outside of the benefits you gain from combining both of them, the hand and eye themselves do also have their own individual effects, where the hand will make your strength score become 20, and it will also add an additional 2d8 cold damage with your melee attacks, and it has charges that allow you to cast a number of spells, with standout ones being Teleport or Finger of Death. And the eye grants you True Sight. It allows you to use your action to gain X-ray vision, and has charges to cast its own number of spells with standout ones being the 8th level spell Dominate Monster or Disintegrate, a useful hard-hitting single target damage spell. So the hand and eye are full of almost nothing but really good effects. They allow you to cast some really useful spells with their charges, and it allows you to spam an ability which can instantly kill someone, and it gives you passive regeneration, and of course the free wish spell once every month. But the downsides of the artifact combinations are kinda bad. When you cast a spell from the eye, there's a 5% chance your character will just die and have their soul absorbed by Vecna, and their body will be controlled like a puppet. Also, if you use charges from the hand, you have a suggestion spell cast on yourself, where if you fail a DC 18 saving throw for it, it will command you to commit an evil act. At least the hand is a lot more manageable, and won't instantly kill your character like the eye will. You also have to tear out one of your eyes and cut off your left hand in order to attune to the eye in hand but you get a neat eye and hand replacement, so that's not big of a deal. Unless that is a deal breaker to your character for an RP reason. Oh, and your alignment is changed to neutral evil when you attune to either the eye or hand. But honestly, as long as you just never use the spells associated to these two items, you don't really have to worry about the downsides. And you can still cast the wish spell once every 30 days, and spam your instant kill ability by touching things. Assuming you successfully land the touch attack, and they fail the saving throw. The spells are really nice though, so I can totally see trying to risk it, but you don't have to, and it's still useful. And because of just how ridiculously useful the wish spell is, the Iron Hand of Vecna kind of has to take number one spot on this list. It's definitely another 9 out of 10 artifact item. Would probably be a 10 out of 10 if it didn't have such bad downsides. Alright, and that's it for the artifact items. Funny enough, artifacts aren't really the go-to way to increase your damage the most. They just kind of give you a lot of special abilities to use. So if you're in a campaign where you can get any item you want, you're better off in the very rare and legendary section if you want damage increases. Anyways, if you have any corrections or ideas for future videos, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, because the artifacts are incredibly wordy and confusing, and I probably got a few things wrong, even if I did spend about a week researching everything so the mistakes would be a minimum.